We are the Saquon Band of the Kumeyaay Nation. We are of this land. We build our future by honoring our past. When you talk about the Holy Land, you know, this is our Holy Land. You know, like uh, La Jolla, Mat Kulhui, the place of the caves. You know, that was a, you know, Kumiai word. Or um, Point Loma, that's Mat Nis, Black Land. That's where there were abalone all over the place. Palomar Mountain, Ipalomar, to win with arrows. All that's in our language. Tijuana, Tijuan, place close to the ocean. Tecari, Il Tecat, man who cuts the, the wood. Kuchuma Mountain, which, or Tecari Peak, very sacred place with our people. All these things, our holy land, all these places, we're still here and we watch over the land. The Kumiai word for land and body is the same, mat. So the human person is of the land and the land is of the human person. And you can't separate them like we do. Yeah, yeah, hunt, they play, but they can play. I said, I'm proud that I'm a Native American that I'm on this land. One of the things with all of these artifacts is the way they show how the Kumeyaay have endured and how they continue to endure in this environment. And I think that depth of time that's involved here, 12,000 years, is beyond our comprehension, how people can continue and persevere and maintain in a place, in an environment that's changing, to manage to adapt to not only what they faced prehistorically or in ancient times, but what they faced in the historic period, to continue through that and to persevere and to still be able to celebrate your culture and all of your accomplishments is a really phenomenal story. Hiyai, Hiyai in, in Kumiai means a long time ago. A long time ago, there was two creators, Yokomates and Tuchapa, and they lived in another place, it's like another dimension. And they got tobacco, hatapawuk, and they, the younger one attempted to blow the universe into, into creation, the blue to the north and then blue to the south. But then it caved in on itself. So the older one said, let me help you. So the older one blew smoke to the north and then blew to the south, and then blew to the east and blew to the west and blew to the sky. To the ground and it started to expand like a bubble and that's what created the universe and it's really interesting you know people call this our myth but if you ask scientists today astrophysicists they say the expanding universe as we know it is a bubble our people already knew that so the old one grabbed yellow dirt yellow clay and rolled it up <sighs> blew into it and it started to glow and it got hot it was burning held it on his thumb, flipped it into the air, and that became the sun. And what our word for our soul or our spirit is called matau, the fire that glows within ourselves. So when we say, in our language, when we greet somebody, we say hauka, we're basically saying, may that fire in you continue to glow brightly. When I read the Kumeyaay creation story, and it talks about coming from a place of darkness, where it was cold, and that they moved into a different area than they started, that is not that disparate from what most scientists believe. We know they've been here 12,000 and probably longer. So if you want to look at it, it's 12,000 years ago, but it's 10,000 years before Christ. If you go back beyond Christ to the, the early Roman period, the Greco period, the Assyrians, the Sumerians, the great cultures of the Fertile Crescent that later became Persia uh, with all their agriculture, that was 8,000 years ago. So we're talking 4,000 years before the big agricultural societies of Europe developed. These people were on the land. It was the end of the Ice Age. It was cool. It was rainy. It's things you aren't expecting in Southern California. But Native Californians were living here and making extremely sophisticated tools. And this is one example of those. It's a Clovis point. 
and it's probably one of the finest examples in North America. This is the height of flint napping technology and they were taking quartz crystals, which are extremely hard to flake, and turning them not only into deadly weapons, but also beautiful works of art. And this particular example is from Eastern San Diego County. It dates to around 12,000, 12,500 years ago, and was actually found just lying on the surface. We used to have a lot more bear. We used to have antelope down here in San Diego County, but if you go back 12,000 years, the people who were living here were actually hunting a uh, small mastodon, what we call pygmy mammoth, a lot of deer, certainly rabbits, and, and they would go out within eight to 10 miles of this area and, and hunt these with initially spears, then later through time dart points, and then later through time bows and arrows. So as the environment changed, the people changed. They said, okay, well, if we're not gonna get a 600 pound ground sloth, what's the next animal? Well, let's eat more deer. Let's eat more rabbit. My involvement in Kumeyaay history has been a, a personal passion of mine. I'm, I wasn't trained as a historian. My, my degree is in engineering. I'm a former aerospace engineer. I went into the environmental field in 1990. And as I began to do more in the area of environmental management and I began to, to research and analyze the cultural practices that had managed the environment in this area for thousands of years, I began to find the level of sophistication that went into a lot of things and the sciences, the, the engineering, the astronomy. There was a considerable amount of knowledge and I began to see there's these people who are not being portrayed accurately and, and, they're, and they're my people. One of the things I think that happens when we study prehistoric people or pre-contact people like the Kumeyaay is we don't understand the depths of their knowledge of science and of chemistry and of pharmacology. And uh, I think some people were surprised to find out sometime, for instance, that you look at a rock painting, you had to be a chemist to make the oil and the pigment and hold that whole thing together. Their knowledge of astronomy, their ability to know when eclipses were coming, uh, the mountain behind us here, Mount Woodson was one of the sentinel peaks for predicting eclipses and moon cycles. I think they were very much into the cycles of nature as a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year period. So the Kwasai, the holy man who was the plant specialist, probably knew a year or two in advance when the plants were going to go through a drought, when there was going to be an El Nino. We sit back and kind of wait for it to happen. Well, the Kumeyaay way of life prior to the first invasion by the Europeans uh, was uh, a way of life of a free and ind independent existence and uh, primarily the people lived in small villages or in family areas and primarily around areas of water because that's where the animals gather and that's uh, essential for life. Water is life and the Kumeyaay people certainly understood that. A typical Kumeyaay village Unlike the Hollywood Village, the Hollywood Village is it's a bunch of teepees put close together so the camera can pan back and forth. This village, Pamu, would have uh, encompassed roughly a square mile of habitation, of stone tool making, of pottery, but it would have even been larger than that if you think about the suburbs versus the shopping center versus the manufacturing plant versus the hospital. All of that would have been even larger than this. Probably would have supported two to 300 people. It was occupied by five different clans. The basic organizational structure of the Kumeyaay was centered around the Shemul. We commonly use the word clan nowadays because people, especially non-Indians, are more familiar with the term clan, and so we, we talk about our clans, and different clans had different names. Mine was Misquish that, that I'm from, and the clans had alliances or relationships um, with other clans, we would seasonally move through our territory, uh, move from the warmer months from the mountain areas and then go down the drainages to the lower elevations in the desert and the coast during the winter months. And then there were some villages that stayed in those low elevations all year round too. So through a complex system of linkages and, uh, and affiliations between the clans, between Shemulks, we would you know, come together and there was exchange that, that occurred between people and there were exchanges that occurred between tribes. 
Every quartz rock out here has a very specific spirit to it. The plant, before you go out and you take a plant out of the ground, or you grind it, or you take acorns off the oak trees, there's a whole prayer, there's a whole reverence that goes to that, because while they're put here, they're not put here just for you. Spirituality is very deep and, in, and embedded. It's, it is not inseparable. In order for a person to be at their, their strongest, they had to be physically strong, they had to mentally take care of themselves, and they had to physically and mentally put their emotions into becoming spiritually strong. The story about initial contact is actually a story about initial invasion. And it's important to understand that the Christian Europeans who came by ship and overland to the Americas actually had an ideology that they carried with them. They didn't simply bring various forms of technology on their ships, but they also carried a, a way of thinking. And that way of thinking had to do with a right, a divine right in their view, to go forth to lands that had not yet been discovered by Christians and to place those lands under a form of Christian dominion, or as I refer to it as Christian domination. For the Spanish, they knew that there was no way they can control San Diego. A big myth is that when the missions came here to San Diego, that the Kumeyaay were so thankful and that they had been so behind the world in culture and education that these Spanish people somehow came here and liberated them. And the truth is that this Kumeyaay people had a, had a culture that was thousands of years old. They already had government systems that were in place that they were able to live peaceful existences. They had a culture that they, they respected and they enjoyed, a way of life and a means of living in this land that they were succeeding, they were thriving. And I still hear people talk about the Spaniards building the missions. No Spaniard ever made an adobe block that I know of. They were all made by the Kumeyaay. No Spaniard built Padre Dam in Mission Trails Regional Park. That was built by Kumeyaay people. The trails that every explorer followed, all those great intrepid explorers, they always had an Indian in front of them or they were already on an Indian trail. So the only people who were lost were the Europeans. The Indians were never lost. So I don't know how one could say they discovered San Diego. California history didn't start with the missions, and Indian history didn't end with the missions. But that's the impression you get when you look at the way history has been taught in California in the school system. Of course, when they have the missions, they have to have somebody to be missionaries too, so it's almost like they're forced to acknowledge the fact that there were Indians that lived here. If the history, the human history of San Diego County is one hour, the Europeans have been here half a minute. So we have been here half a minute. All the rest of that was Native American. And yet when you pick up a textbook, when you hear a lecture somewhere, it's always about those later people. It's about us. It's about the Spaniards. It's about the Mexicans. It's about mission-style architecture, Balboa Park. And so when you look at it in the time frame of minutes to years, we haven't been here a great deal. The reaction of the Kumeyaay people to this onslaught of the uh, mission system uh, throughout California, but specifically in the Kumeyaay territory, was well illustrated by the burning of the San Diego Mission de Ocala by the Kumeyaay people in 1775. And in November of that year, numerous bands of the Kumeyaay nation came together and burned the mission to the ground and the priest was killed. That was a very strong statement as to how the Kumeyaay felt about the tremendous loss of life. There was a very high death rate among the people in the mission systems. I believe that the statistic was that your lifespan was about six years once you entered into that mission system. I think one of the reasons the Kumeyaay have done so well as a culture is when the Spaniards came in, they adapted. They said, okay, you're gonna make us grow some corns and beans and things that we didn't traditionally grow here, some wheats and barleys. We'll learn how to do that. And if we like that food, we'll introduce it into our own. So in 1777, when a Spanish group came through here on the way to Julian, these people here were growing wheat. There was no wheat being grown at the Mission San Diego. They got that wheat from some other mission and brought it here and planted it. And the Spaniards are going, why is there wheat growing here? And someone said, oh, it must not be real wheat. It was, it was real wheat. People are always amazed when I tell them that the Spanish only controlled a tiny strip of the coast. Most of California was under the control of Indian people all throughout the Spanish period. And during that time, there was constant warfare that was occurring with the free Indian people 
and they were launching attacks. In some cases, hundreds of warriors would join in on attacks against the Spanish. So it was, it was never the case that they really controlled more than that, that strip. Now they had the technology with their leather armor, uh, metal helmets, and their firearms. They had the, the capability of extending their power anywhere they wanted. So they could take a patrol and they could go through any of our territory, but they never controlled it. As soon as they left, it was back under our control. We know a great deal about this village because it shows up in mission records. And while it had been here for thousands of years, in 1778, it was actually attacked by people from the Presidio of San Diego, by Spaniards, because the Native Americans of Pamu, the Ipai, refused to come in and be missionized. When the missions tried to improve their situation, the way they did that was not by sending in a military force. They didn't do that by going in and taking all the Kumeyaay bands down at once. That was an impossibility. Instead, they would go group by group, they would go village by village, and if they could find a small village, they would take that village, and they would take the kids if they were able to, they would take the people they saw as leaders if they were able to, and they would take over that village. Most of the Kumeyaay people understood this, and they retreated back to larger villages in their area. It speaks to that very real interaction between the Spaniards and, and the Kumeyaay people on this site. They finally abandoned the site about 1810, it looks like, because the Spaniards were coming up here doing more cattle grazing and setting up some haciendas nearby. So the people of this village, as was the case with many villages in San Diego, went further back into the interior. So when it comes time to set up the reservations, that's where they are today. And I think one of the misconceptions many people have is why didn't they live on the coast? Well, they did, but they were shoved off the coast. The next major event in terms of the overall chronology would probably be the Mexican Revolution, the bid for Mexico to win its independence from Spain. And that began in 1810, and that culminated in 1824 with the establishment of the first Mexican Constitution, and as it was called, the Mexican Empire. Under the Mexican system, there was a secularization of the missions, in other words, a disbanding of the mission system. But also under the Mexican system, you had a tremendous number of Mexican land grants of the Kumeyaay territory, and that resulted in thousands of acres of the prime real estate within the Kumeyaay territory being granted to very influential Mexican people. This caused a lot of concern for the Indian people who, who had lived un, in the Mexican system and, and were part of it. And a lot of them chose to rebel. And they joined forces with the free Kumeyaay who still controlled the majority of their territory. And these attacks became more and more effective from the 1830s to the 1840s. We like to sometimes refer to those as the Zorro years. This was a period of uprisings when the ranchos started falling uh, all over the place. They, they were being abandoned and the raids were becoming more and more effective and, and by the 1840s, we were launching attacks directly on the city of San Diego itself. The next phase after the Mexican period is the, uh, what's called the American period, which would be the Mexican-American War of 1846 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. At that point, everything is considered to be under American control. There were huge amounts of gold that had been discovered. Within a matter of a few decades, there was more gold mined in California than had been mined in the rest of the world for a couple hundred years. So this was a massive amount of wealth that was coming out of the ground. If there was any question at all as to who really owned that gold, that would be a huge issue. And the best way to extinguish any kind of claims or any kind of doubt as to who owns it is to kill whoever might be someone who could make that claim. The Treaty of San Isabel was one of 18 treaties that were negotiated in California in the early 1850s. Our treaty was negotiated in 1852. All of the treaties together set aside about seven and a half million acres of land in California for Indian people. At that time, this was before the Civil War, and 
there was a lot of fear that California might decide to join with the secessionist states. There was a lot of southern migration into California, and when the California legislature and the California congressional delegation lobbied against the ratification of the treaties, they, the Senate caved in on it. But one of the problems they had was that Indians were still a sizable portion, if not the majority, of the population in the state. And so they didn't want to have mass uprisings throughout California. So one of the ways that they dealt with that was they voted down the treaties, but they kept that decision sealed. And they never told the Indian people that they didn't, that they didn't approve the treaties. Remember, a lot of these Indian people had occupations under the Mexican system. They had worked as vaqueros, and they had worked as blacksmiths, they had worked in you know, all these different trades. So many of them decided that you know, they were going to set up their own ranches, and they thought they had the protections of their treaty. So they built ranches, they fenced land, they put cattle out, they put horses out. And then a white settler would come in and file a homestead on it, and he'd have a ready-made ranch, and he'd just take the land. And if the Indian was lucky, the white owner might allow him to stay on the land and, and work as a ranch hand on the very ranch that he created and built. And Indian people were confused. They didn't know what was going on. They thought they had protections, and yet people were coming and filing homesteads on them. And it was during this time also that, that the state of California decided that the real solution was to get rid of the Indians entirely. For the American period, their interactions with the Kumeyaay was to erase their culture, to take their land, and to try to take everything they could from these people for economic gain. And the state of California sponsored programs to kill Indians. There were bounties that were placed on Indians. The, there were laws that were passed that allowed Indian children to be taken from their homes and adopted out. They went through an adoption process, but they weren't really treated as their children. They, they used them as slave labor in the household. Some of the villages, the men were killed, and the women and girls were taken to the brothels. There were vagrancy laws that were passed in California, which if an Indian person was found who had no visible means of support, if you didn't have a white person who would say, he's your boss, then you could be arrested as a vagrant. And the punishment for being a vagrant was six months labor. At the end of that time, if you didn't have someone who would say that you're working for them, you could be rearrested as a vagrant again for another six months. So it was a form of slave labor that was adopted in California. According to Dr. Florence Shippick, the overall Kumeyaay population was estimated to be roughly 30,000 people in 1769 at the time of the founding of the San Diego Mission. By the Mexican period in 1834 uh, up to the American period, that had also declined through all of the Spanish mission period, the Mexican period, so that by 1846 she estimated that the overall population of Kumeyaay was 18 to 20,000. However, through the American period, the decline increased further, and by 1890, there were fewer than 900 Kumeyaay remaining. So that was a decline of roughly 96 to 97 percent of the entire population of the Kumeyaay people of the Kumeyaay Nation. When our reservations were created, starting in, in 1875, most of them by 1893, in some cases there were many different clans that were living in those areas. And because we were all culturally linked to each other as Degenios or Kumeyaay people, they referred to us as bands. We were, um, you know, the Campo Band, the Manzanita Band, the, the Sequan Band of Mission Indians. And mission just became a generic term for all of the Indians in Southern California. The word Degenio was added into a lot of the names, so it would be the Sequan Band of the Degenio Mission Indians to, to distinguish them from other tribes or other nations in other parts of Southern California. That's actually how we're referred to in the Treaty of San Isabel. Ulysses S. Grant signed that proclamation, not asking us where we want to go, but said, you will go out to this little valley, you get one square mile of property, and you live there. That was it. But there's 18 tribes in San Diego County. 
Many people, a lot of people don't know that. It's the most tribes in the whole United States in one little county, San Diego is the one. For the reservations, when they were created, most of the people that lived on those reservations, it was a sad, sad time for them. You still hear the elders today talk about their experiences growing up, and they talk about their parents and their grandparents and the experiences they had. And whether it's three generations back or the last generation, you hear so many similarities, so many commonalities. You hear about how there was no hope, that there was an absence of hope because when they would look around at their community, very rarely would you see somebody doing something special. You never, very rarely would you see somebody out having a, a, a chance at bettering themselves. There was very little opportunity out there. This was a group of people that were used to roaming. They were used to going out and traveling. They were used to living off the land, but now they were given a chunk of land that they were not able to live off of. They became dependent on this government, this new government. I was born at the Wobick Indian Hospital. That is in Riverside County. That's up there by Hemet. So what was a reservation. And uh, the reason I was born there, because my mom, they had the county hospital in, I don't know what they call it now, in San Diego. And they would let her go there because they were in them days, they were prejudiced. You know, if you're not the right color, you couldn't go in there. I was born here in 1935 at the house we lived in, which is west of here. I was going to Dehesa School. It was a one room, little red schoolhouse it was. It had a red roof, had a bell tower, and it had a big uh, stove in the back, in the back of the room. Uh, there were 21 students total from the first to the eighth grade. There was one teacher. The teacher was a janitor, maintenance person, and a teacher. That was our school. Go into El Cajon once in a while for shopping. And into San Diego was a big thing, you know, to go to San Diego, you know. There's an unwritten rule where we only stayed around Fifth and Market. That was it. You couldn't go beyond that. It was during the war when uh, a couple of kids grabbed me one day and said I was a Jap. I use that term because that's what they called me. You know, hit me and said, you, you started the war. You know, and I, here I was an Indian. I had nothing to do with starting the war. <laughs> and then I can recall one time sitting in, in a fourth grade in a geography class. And uh, the teacher was talking, talking about the Indians and the Pueblos and all that. Then she turned around and looked at us and said, well, the Indians were just savages, you know. And then one of the students said, looked at me and said, hey, Henry's, Henry's a savage. It hurt me, but uh, these are some of the things that I ran across. I remember one thing my aunt said one time, said she never knew she was in a depression, that the country's in depression because she was in depression all her life. For my parents' generation, there was very little opportunity. The only opportunity you had was to go into the military, perhaps uh, some kind of federal job like a firefighter. The education, for that generation was very, very limited. The education they had said that their traditional way of life was no good, that the language that they may have heard at home was worthless. It was the ultimate self-esteem killer. And so for them, it had to be a sad time, a bitter time, and a time where there was no, no promise of a future, a time where there was no light at the end of the tunnel. There was a shame factor. The Indians in those days, all Indians in those days, because we were looked down upon as those so-and-so Indians, you know. My parents told me, said, proud that you're a Native American. My mom taught me in the Indian all the time. Your blood is an Indian. Be proud of that. I feel it was a struggle for our people to keep their identity just because we couldn't practice our religion and because of the boarding schools, because the, the enforcement of saying you can no longer speak your language anymore. You can no longer practice religion because you're doing something. You're doing something against our way, the American way. We're the original habitats here. This is our homeland. You know, our homeland extends from the ocean out to the desert. 3,700,000 acres of property. And today, that has been reduced to 124,000 acres in the possession of the various Kumeyaay bands, and roughly 193 square miles as opposed to 6,000 square miles. So it's been a tremendous reduction in the overall 
uh, Kumeyaay land base in terms of the amount of the Kumeyaay territory that is being used to benefit the non-Kumeyaay society at large. The phrase generation gap, for me, hearing the stories that my, my grandmother tells me about how it wasn't ideal to be Indian, it wasn't favorable, and having to lie about her ethnicity to get jobs because it wasn't ideal to be Native American. And I think that's why a lot of things weren't passed on to the next generation because it was thought that they would have a better chance of getting an education, making a life by mainstreaming. Whereas now, we don't have to hide those things. We have a chance. This generation realizes the importance and, and how much has been lost and they're really picking it up and, and bringing it back. When I graduated high school, there was only four people from my reservation that had a college degree. And then I got mine. And then I continued on and I got a master's degree. I was only the second person from my community, from my tribal group to have a master's degree. Since then, it's been over a decade and you see numerous young, you know, young children going for a college education. And so you see our situation getting better. You see it getting better, but it's going to take time. It's going to take a long time for our people to get back to where they once were. I know that some kids strive to go to college. Some kids strive to make themselves better, you know, within themselves. And I, I believe that they will come back to the reservation and bring that here, teach the other kids how to continue that. We've always been patient people. We've been denied so much over our years. And from the federal government, state government. But we just sit back and wait, kind of like the rabbit and a turtle. You know, the turtle just moves on along and he makes it. Yeah. Well, we didn't have much, uh, Actually, that's for sure. Yeah. What we had, though, we had the ability to support each other and rally around each other. If something happened, the families pulled together and we always helped each other out. Being family, just one community, you know, that's what I remember the most is if anything was happening, we're down there. But yeah, we didn't have much money. I can remember on the council when our checking account, the tribal checking account, was, I have a copy of it at home, it's $846 was our, was our balance. In November 1983, we opened up our bingo hall. It was a 105 by 200 feet, I guess, dimensions of the building, a metal building. I didn't think we'd go any further than that. There was a tin building, it was like a storage building, and there was 1,400 seats, and it was like a big party in there. I mean, it was just fun. I tell you, well, I was on council when I was 18, yeah. and I remember Anna Sandoval brought that forward sure. to yeah. the council. And I remember it was actually a, it scared me a little bit because we didn't know what that meant, you know? Someone coming out investing all these dollars into a business out there, and it was that trust, that trust we had to learn, you know, because um, I personally didn't really trust too many people back in the day, because not too many people did many things for us. Yeah, they sure didn't. But to get that going, Anna Sandoval was absolutely, the maverick, you may say, or the person who drove that. Yeah, when she got approached by investors and, mm -hmm. and brought it to the tribe, that's where the, the seed was planted. And she had envisioned this bingo hall. I don't think she envisioned it to become like a casino the way it turned out to be now, with machines and you know card tables. It was just a bingo hall then. And back then, it was just to provide for us to have a house, some food. I tell you, when we went to, uh, had our general council meeting, I think there was, what, f either 15 or 17 tribal members who actually voted, and it wasn't unanimous. So it wasn't like everybody was for it all at once. We did it so we could yeah. provide for education, and just get some economic boom to our reservation, because we didn't have much. Homes, infrastructure, health care, everything. But um, to see that amount of people on the reservation was that day we knew a major change was coming to Sequan. It was great for our young kids to be able to see their dads or uncles or sisters or aunties dressed up really well and, and holding these uh, positions like that. So we didn't have to go look out and find role models anywhere else anymore. They're right there in your home and right there in your homeland. Mom had a vision for us to have a better life. And you know, thanks to her and some of the elders that voted for the, the bingo hall were allowed to have that. I think the biggest drill I got today coming like when I come in from El Cajon and I drive down that grade and look out beyond us, that's ours. That belongs to the Quan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation from here to this golf course to our reservation.
Our villages were here. We have a lot of artifacts that are here. And it's just a, a good feeling to be part of that. It really is. So the most important thing people need to understand, we're not just a casino, we're not just a golf course, we are an actual government. Our sovereignty is what we have to make us different than anybody else. It makes our government what it is. It makes us sovereignty is who we are today. Without our sovereignty, we have none of this. Our younger generation needs to understand who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. When I was very young, I knew, I had, I had a, a, an awareness that, that my Native American heritage was unique, my membership within a, a tribe was unique, and I knew that the tribe itself was a, a unique entity. I would always try to sneak into the adult membership meetings when I was young because they got to talk about planning the community. I also realized from a very young age that nobody would be able to develop that future but ourselves. We have a youth tribal council and they are all very involved and they have a lot of energy that I'm very happy to see because I had that same energy when I was younger. And so I think if they are able to keep focus and to move forward, that they're gonna do great things for the community. I see most of the younger kids now getting more involved in tribal politics, which is a good thing to me because I, I, when I was a child, I never understood poli politics at all. So understanding it now and seeing the kids as our youth councils getting more involved and, and looking towards their future and what they like to see change, I think is just a beautiful thing. I would love to be a tribal leader in the future one of these days. Like I, that's. That's a goal. When we talk about sovereignty, it's not just a word or a catchphrase of the day. It is definitely something that all ages, all generations need to have a strong understanding of what it truly means to be a sovereign nation within the great nation of the United States. We have our own law enforcement, our own fire department, our own clinic, we have our own health care. Those are the things that we take care of our people. And the only way we could do it if we're a sovereign nation and that sovereignty just fits right in the middle of all of this for all of us to understand that the government always comes first because the government is the people. I was involved in, uh, in uh, civil rights movements and all that in the 60s and 70s. And and that's what prompted me to start the fire department because we need to do our own fire department. And so I did that for the protection of myself, my family, and other family members. I got a donated 1968 Dodge pickup from Gas and Electric Company. And I said, if you give me a fire truck with fuel and all that training, we will respond to all the areas that you guys can't go. We protect the entire Dehisa Valley. We've done it for almost 40 years. In some instances, we're the first reactors. Uh, so we got to make sure that our fire department and ambulance service are ready to go. 95% of our calls are off reservation. And it's important because people do have heart attacks out there. And they do thank us for showing up because, you know, three minutes is a long time. The key understanding is that we are TPI. We're EPI. We're the people. Just take care of yourself. Take care of your community. Be one of the people. And in our belief, everything will work out. Everything will be fine. It's very important that the outside community knows that that Saquon is much more than a successful gaming operation. We have a long history in this community, and we look forward to building on that history for many more generations to come. As a Saquon tribal member, I believe that I'm most proud to be a neighbor in this community, to give like we give, and to be respectful of everything around us. Community service shows who you are as a person because it shows that you care for people and you want to make this community the best that you can. We're there to help, and we've done a lot of help in the community by donating to organizations, foundations, but we're doing something, we're not sitting back and saying, well, you treated us bad for 500 years, now we're gonna pay back, that isn't it. Yeah. And that's how, that's a tradition of a na native tribe and native people, is you help one another. I'll tell you one thing I can guarantee you, you come to my homeland, and if you're cold and hungry, I will shelter you, and I will feed you. I will take care of you, that's what I will do. 
we speak of revitalization and taking an active role in learning our culture and our language and songs and dances, that's when it truly makes a difference. So for someone like me who wasn't raised knowing my language, really raised knowing my culture, yeah, some of the traditions and things I knew that were around, but what's extremely important for this next generation is to make sure it's not something that they have to go out and learn, but something that is consistent already in their life. So it's not somewhat of an obligation to them. It's who they are. It becomes their foundation, a strong ground for them to stand on. So where everything else around them might crumble, the thing that won't is their foundation. It was really cool, it was really neat to see the kids come home, like my nieces and nephews, and speak kumyai, or say colors in kumyai, um, numbers in kumyai, and the parents were like, what? Because they couldn't even speak it. And in a lot of ways, now they're learning at the same time. And it's not just the adults teaching the kids, now the kids are teaching us. I believe the goal is to balance education with cultural enrichment, also with the youth. We start here with a infant toddler program, and a preschool program. And we also follow that up with a liaison program to keep touch with the children as they progress through kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Like my mother and her mother, that I just want better for my kids. And um, I want them to get a good education. I want them to be the best that they can be, um, whether it be in sports or chemistry, whatever it is. I just want them to be better than I was. The birth song is important to the Kumeyaay people. We sing about where we go, talk about ourselves, talk about the, the surroundings. We talk about death. We talk about the animals. We talk about the stars. <laughs> The bird songs that we have today, we believe to be ancient. The words that are in those bird songs, they have meaning. It's not a chant, it's not a series of sound effects. Every part of that song has a meaning. But back in the day, the elders wouldn't let, allow the youngsters to go into where they were singing. In their belief, it wasn't time for them. Kids should be playing. But I went behind the Ramada, where they were singing, I listened back there. I started me learning some of the songs, then later when I became of age, then I was able to go in and stand with the, with the elders and sing, and I learned. I feel good at heart because I'm carrying on those songs for the, for the funerals, uh, you know, the wakes, uh, the celebrations. Uh, I'm able to comfort the people when they lose their lo loved ones. Uh, I'm able to ha have People enjoy themselves in the celebration time. It feels really good to know that uh, when one moves on, that we're there to help that person on their journey, which is very important. But to be able to sing at events too, the festive events, is uh, very nice to be able to get back to our people. You know, the songs that I sing here don't, doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people. It belongs to the Creator. It belongs to Saquon. It belongs to Barona. All the people, that, that's their song. Those songs are really old, and um, to be able to sing those songs means so much to me, because it tells us we're still here. To be able to sing those songs and, and be that connection, because our elders are, are up there in age, you know, and I feel so responsibility as men, as Native men, to be able to hand these down, all this uh, spirituality the philosophy. So be able to learn these means everything to me so I can hand it down to my children. The songs have come back to our people. Our women are getting up and dancing. Our young kids are getting up and singing and dancing. You're seeing all of this excitement about our songs and our old stories. Even though they were almost gone, they almost left us. They were still there hanging on by just a thread. I'm 70 years old now, you know, and I I don't know uh, how, much, how much time the Creator is going to give me and if I can pass these songs on to the younger kids and they can carry it on, I'll be glad. I'll feel good at heart. One time I was making a pot and I took real good care of it and I fired it and I broke it. It just broke in the fire. 
My mother-in-law looked, and I was getting ready to throw it away, and she, she told me, and Kumi, I know. She said, bring that. What we did was we ground it up, and we mixed it with new dirt, and we were able to make a pot, and it stayed. And now we're coming together, just like that broken pot. You can either be angry, you know, at what happened in the past, but if I'm angry, I can't pay attention to what I'm doing now is helping to put these things back together. When we speak our language, when we pass these things on, the cultural things, the creation story, all these things, when we do our ceremonies, we're, we're not victims. We are survivors. I'm very optimistic about the future of Sukhoi. I see it, I see it from, from just the youth, from the attitudes in people my age, my generation, and the, the pride in the elders' eyes that, that this circle will continue to move forward. There's a reference to even with Saquon's logo that the, the circle was broken. The original Aboriginal circle, a, a way of life, was broken with the onset of European discovery. There's this saying that, that our circle will never be complete and we're always striving to complete that circle. We'll look back in the history of Saquon and any gaming will just be one of many chapters in our history, but it will not be the story. It might be a very, very celebrated time because it has definitely been an economic turning point for the tribe. But as we go on and build other businesses, other ventures, other partnerships, that gaming will definitely be seen as being a step in the path to a better future. I'm excited about the future because I know that we are one people. We make a stance. We're still here and we're still thriving. I'm just so impressed by the fact that versus some other areas of America that the Kumeyaay are still here. And while the population's a little off because they're not all native San Diegans, in the last census, the Native American population finally got back to where it was in 1769. I admire the Kumeyaay people and what a miracle it is that they've been able to survive everything they've been through and uh, to excel and to um, be able to achieve the great things that they have achieved. And I see that they will achieve even greater things as they move into the future generations. Well, our ancestors fought for what they believe in, and that's why we have all this today. So I'm very thankful for what they did, and here we are. There's moments in my life where I think, are we as a people going to be here? Will we be here in the future? Will we have a language? These songs I sing, will they be here tomorrow? When I'm gone, will they be here? And when I see my kids sing this song, when I see them get out there and sing and dance, I have no question as to whether they'll be here tomorrow. I have no question as to whether our people will be here. I know our language, our culture. I know everything that we are as Kumeyaay will forever be here in San Diego. We've been here since the creation of human history, and I believe we'll be here until there's humans not here. We'll always be here as Kumeyaay.